Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Making It Personal is provided by Sarah Vocations Ministry. Learn more at joinserra.org. Making It Personal with Bishop William Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com. Welcome to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. I'm Jean Till, and on today's show, we're visiting with Monsignor Dennis Lyle, who is the pastor of St. Mary Magdalene Parish in Chicago and the speaker at the Priest's Fall Workshop. But before we get to that, Bishop, this coming week is the Iowa Catholic Radio Fall Fundraiser, and your support, folks, of this ministry reaches beyond the walls of your parish and the boundaries of our diocese. It reaches deep into the hearts of those searching for God. So help us help them in their journey to encounter Jesus. You can support Iowa Catholic Radio by going online to iowacatholicradio.com. Bishop? And Gene, you've been a longtime uh, personality with Iowa Catholic Radio. Oh, I've been told I have a personality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, that's, yeah. yeah well, we won't that's even a, touch that yeah, one, right? John, John, I'll let him comment on that, your husband. <laughs> but anyway, no, uh, the, the important evangelization yes. in, in the ministry that we have here and that footprint keeps expanding as they acquire uh, new towers and new rights to expand. And so I think that's just a, a beautiful thing. And mm-hmm. uh they're not asking me to sing or dance or do anything. In no. fact, they asked me not to. Oh, and so okay. that was a part of what the, <laughs> we're going about. But uh, it is that season two and other opportunities to support worthy endeavors. Yes. St. Vincent de Paul Walk yes. is going to happen tomorrow at the Scotch Ridge Nature Trail out in mm-hmm. Carlisle. Mm-hmm. Yours truly will be giving the blessing. And uh, they're going to let me either decide to ride or walk, you know. So mm. we might make it all the way to Indianola. You never know. I was going to say, how of, far of a it's walk? It's the start of that yeah. trail there, mm-hmm. you know, as you come off Highway 5. And yep. beautiful. A little bit of an incline there to it get, is. you know, to put the burn in the legs. Mm-hmm. But uh, after that, it's smooth sailing. And so all are welcome to participate in the St. Vincent de Paul Walk. There'll be a chance for refreshments and everything that. Uh, partake of that. Uh, looking forward to Sunday, going to St. Patrick Irish Settlement, you know, the oldest parish in the diocese yep. for the Sacrament of Confirmation. It's Beautiful. still mindful and at this time of year, the Pope's visit in 1979. Mm-hmm. and uh, October that, 3rd, that, you know, right? That, uh, yeah, I, yeah. Maybe the 4th. 3rd or 4th, yeah. Yeah, the Feast of St. Francis, you mm-hmm. know, but they were already queuing up, I think, on the 3rd, so that was very good. And then we'll follow that with uh, Christ the King and confirmation there, so sandwiched among those things. And in the midst of that, St. Ambrose Parish event, the Hmong community is going to be hosting something. I can't join for Mass, but I'm going to be there for the, the other fun part of the of the day. There'll and be so, music, and so they'll be dancing. Be a great thing, so <laughs> right? too. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> And a very unique rhythm to go That's with right. that. So uh, they've asked me not to dance there too. So, but uh, conscious of uh, uh, not father yet, but uh, Michael Mahoney, mm-hmm. Saint Francis of Assisi Parish, son of uh, Tom and Celia, will be ordained to the transitional diaconate in Saint Peter's Basilica next Thursday, the twenty eighth. Oh, and beautiful! So father Ross Parker, our director of vocations, will be able to be there. Archbishop Coakley of Oklahoma City will be the ordaining prelate. Uh, I'm sure some of our, our new seminarian, Connor Lynch, and mm-hmm. uh, Father Alex Kramer will be there to, to pray and to give witness. Uh, Michael's a fine uh, young man. He's done lots of different ministries. I'm sure the people at St. John's Norwalk, who had him on his pastoral year last year, are beaming at uh, yes. all that's happening as they maybe take a little hand in the, the formative mm-hmm. road for him and all that he's doing in that. Also, we're conscious next week of the International Day of Peace at the Cowles Peace Garden on Thursday, the 23rd, or mm. excuse me, excuse me, that, no, I've got the date wrong on that. That took place yesterday. I'm sorry. Mm. So we're getting off track here a little bit, but so many good things happening <laughs> that we want to keep it flowing as well. And uh, the farmers are itching, you know, Father Trevor Sheik went out in Cass County, keeps giving me a report of where things stand for mm-hmm. the harvest. So, uh, uh, you know. Yeah, he, the corn just keeps turning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's like it, it wants and that long. And the beans maybe come out first, mm-hmm. but... Uh, Father Trevor and others who were newly uh, inducted into the Equestrian Order of the Holy Sepulchre in St. Louis last weekend. So that experience of the, you know, the, the regional church, but the support and the solidarity of the Church of Jerusalem and our Christians there who obviously under sometimes the shadow of, of conflict and all that who continue to need our prayers, but also our material support in a very beautiful way. So uh, looking forward with Monsignor Lyle, old-time friend, and uh, the message that he shared with the priests of the four dioceses of Iowa after we make the turn. Well, we're going to take a quick break, and when we return, we'll be visiting with Monsignor Dennis Lyle, who is the pastor of St. Mary Magdalene Parish in Chicago and a speaker at the Priest Fall Workshop. You're listening to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and the Spirit Catholic Radio Network. 
When you give God your time, He changes your life forever. I love how Iowa Catholic Radio always gives me and my friends from the parish truth to inspire, uplift us, really get us thinking and discussing our faith. It's the Fall Fundraiser on Iowa Catholic Radio. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio is provided by Catholic Charities of the Diocese of Des Moines, where empowering individuals and strengthening families have been the cornerstone of care for a century. Services for neighbors in need include a food pantry, professional counseling, emergency family shelter, and refugee resettlement. At Catholic Charities, lives are transformed and you can be part of the mission. To learn more about how to help Catholic Charities fulfill Christ's promise of help and hope, visit catholiccharitiesdm.org. Iowa Catholic Radio, connecting listeners to Christ every day with people like you. Hi, this is Father P.J. McManus from the Diocese of Des Moines. Thanks for listening to Iowa Catholic Radio. Welcome back to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. And on today's show, we're visiting with Monsignor Dennis Lyle, who is the pastor of St. Mary Magdalene Parish in Chicago and a speaker at this uh, fall workshop for the newly ordained. He is the keynote speaker. He is the the guy. Yeah, Father Dan Kirby of St. John's in Norwalk, who oversees for the Diocese of Des Moines. But we always are the the host site now for the four dioceses every fall of the newly ordained priests. And so this is an expectation in the first uh, phase of their priesthood that they continue to reflect. And also, I think, just to... You know, be in, in solidarity with each other, you know. I mean, that uh, even though geographically there may be some spread, uh, whether they went to the same seminary or not. So please to have Monsignor Dennis Lyle. Uh, watch out. We may be calling each other by our first names here because we go back uh, <laughs> quite a ways. My one-year wonder at the Casa Santa Maria in Rome where we first met. But uh, he's been a friend of, of uh, priests and seminarians in Iowa. He's come help to give retreats. So this is nothing new. So Father Dennis, Monsignor Dennis, uh, proper recognition to you. Yeah, so I'm sure you're not one to that because you are a priest priest in so many ways. And uh, I have the utmost respect for you. And I'm so happy that you were able to be with our younger priests just to, as they see who you are as well. So uh, life is full now as a, as a pastor. You've had many hats in your priesthood. Uh, just uh, again, well, where have you landed now, and what has uh, the Archbishop asked of you, or the Lord, more likely? So, thank you for the invitation to join you here, Bishop Johnson, this, this morning. Yeah, um, you know, I had spent so much of my priesthood doing seminary work, uh, both teaching and then as a rector, and then at the Mundelein at, at Mundelein Carmel, Seminary. Carmel, Carmel, I, I think Mary we had many of our students uh, from Des Moines, and I'm sure there's some that are still priests mm-hmm. here in the in the art in the diocese. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was in the office of vicar for priests. And, uh, you know, that's the area where you're dealing with the priests that are going through difficulties and challenges. And that was actually a very rewarding experience. Um, you know, you really see how God works through our human weaknesses and even guys that fall on tough times. Uh, somehow their ministry is still effective with so many priests. Was so that a particularly people. draining work or did, it, did you find it weighed heavy on your, your soul? Or? No, you know, I, I really didn't. Um, I, I really felt it as a, an honor and a privilege to kind of walk with guys during very difficult times. Oftentimes, you know, if there's an accusation, especially that proves false, you know, they just feel very isolated mm. um, from everybody. And so to be able to stay in contact with them and, you know, even to this day, I'll, I'll get uh, texts from some of the guys just thanking me that they were happy that the vicar for priest office was able to kind of walk with them during those dark times. Mm-hmm. But it was so I, I because found that's it very something that the ordinary maybe has to have a certain you know respectful distance there mm-hmm. as, as certain things are you know processed, right? You know, to, so that the truth might come out, right? Know? Yeah, right, so, right, yeah. Oh. So no, that was a good experience, and I've been in your, uh, in your role in formation of of the seminarians and priests. You felt that was something you were drawing from, even there, a discernment, and uh, yeah, obviously a, a moral theologian. You know, if you, you were to admit, but uh, this was a much more pastoral role. Right? Yes, and of course, you know, they would kind of tease me. Well, now you can deal with all the mistakes you made when you were in the seminary. The guys, <laughs> the guys that you should not have ordained. Now you're dealing with them. Uh, <laughs> Thankfully, Oops. there weren't too many of them. <laughs> the, Payback uh, is oh, wait. as you know. You know when uh, when the seminarians come out as great priests, they do a great job. When they come out with difficulties, it was the seminary's fault. <laughs> so it's just one of those realities that you you kind of learn to deal with, and and you know it's all and they're all in jest. Ah, mm. uh, yeah. 
uh, a native South Sider of Chicago. Born and Con- raised in the city, went through our seminary system, you know, entered uh, at the age of 14 in our high school seminary, and then got ordained when I was 25 after 12 years of seminary, high school, college, and then major seminary at Mundelein. So. But you have this timeless appearance, you know, your premature silver gray, uh, was it? <laughs> yeah, I look like I'm 50 for the last 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> timeless. <laughs> A precocious maturity and now uh, yeah. enduring youth, you know, That's the best of both worlds in that right. way. Right. And, uh, uh, a certain uh, ministry as well to the Spanish-speaking peoples. You're quite fluent in Spanish. How did that come about? Um, we had to study Spanish when I was in seminary, and so uh, I was down in Cuernavaca, Mexico for two summers, and uh, you know I, I learned a lot down there. Unfortunately, like many of us, I had four years of high school Spanish, and you walk out, you know, hola, como esta? Uh, <laughs> muy bien. Muy too? bien, exactly. Yeah, that's about it. Uh, and then my first assignment was in a predominantly Mexican parish. And, and I really did kind of fall in love with the, the Mexican community and feel very comfortable there. And uh, right now it's a great blessing because uh, in the archdiocese, we have uh, plenty of immigrants that are coming up now from Venezuela and Colombia. They're all being housed in our police stations right now. So you have mm-hmm. 30, 40 people sleeping at the front entrance of the police stations and so these aren't I, the people arriving on the bus yes they, they are yeah, and yeah, things, yeah 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 and so uh before they find permanent housing they're being housed in our police stations and the city of chicago has not found a better solution um but uh no it's been a real has per- the church been asked to uh, provide yes and or? you know we're, we're we're trying to do things and, and once again you know kind of the reality of city bureaucracy and things like that and you know who gets the funds uh sadly that plays into all of it as much as people want to talk about helping uh the immigrants mm. that have been coming but you know in many ways i think a lot of the responses are coming from local parishes adopting families or paying for families to stay and then helping them get on their feet until they have, um, you know, proper documentation in order to work. But it really does uh, give you a very different perspective on life. Uh, One of my first visits over there, one of the immigrants told me that he had walked over to a Walmart, which is about a mile and a half or two miles away, which, I mean, it's not far, but of course for us, well, you get in the car and drive over there. Of course, I said, wow, that, that's a long way. And he just said, well, Father, I just walked through seven countries. So, <laughs> you know, so all of a sudden you realize a two-mile walk really is nothing after you've gone, <laughs> walked from seven Venezuela. <laughs> yeah. Wow, yeah. Through that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And so now the present assignment to bring together some parishes and uh, some of the consolidation in the Archdiocese of Chicago and... Uh, uh, what is that like for you? It's kind of a new chapter of your priesthood. Yes, and I, I'm sure this is going on all across the country, uh, the consolidation and merging of parishes. It's not an easy process, and it's a very painful process for people. Uh, the parish that I'm in, we're bringing together a predominantly American, English-speaking community on the south end of Chicago, a predominantly Spanish-Mexican-speaking community, uh, in the area of Blue Island, and then a the black community in Robbins, Illinois, uh, which was kind of a, a center for the black community as they came up in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, it became a mission of one of the other parishes. So we've joined three communities together, and uh, we have the new name of St. Mary Magdalene, which I think is very appropriate. Uh, I have you know found that the Eastern churches take on Mary Magdalene as the apostle to the apostles, and really the one that uh, was the first to spread the good news of the resurrection is so key today. So when we're always talking about evangelization, I, I think she's an an outstanding model uh, to use. Oh, yeah. And, and so turf issues or the grieving that people go through, but is there a, a sense of solidarity that's emerging and... Uh... You know, what would be one or two things before we turn to your, your topic for, for the young priest? Yes, there is. You know, I, I do think it, it just takes time. You know, everybody is st- still figuring out. So we merged, I think, two years ago. You know, the dust is still settling. Uh, people are determining where they want to go, what they want to do. 
Um, you know, different groups are, I'm not saying vying for influence and things like that, but you have everybody, you know, wants to kind of do what they used to do. And that's probably the biggest challenge. Um, you're changing my math time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And yeah. Those, those are, and you know, and it, mm-hmm. it really is difficult. They're not popular. And sadly, you know, we lose people for something as simple as that. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I see those things, that's when I realize how, how in need, you know, the church is of really renewing and helping our people understand what is their faith all about and what is a parish ab- about. You know, you had mentioned my work in the seminary, and uh, people often ask me, you know, the difference between seminary work and parish work. And I say in the seminary, everybody knows why you're there. You know, from the staff to the students to the faculty, we're there to form future priests. In a parish, you don't necessarily have that, you know, unanimous vision about what we're about. Or, well, my child's in the school, or I'm part of the women's club, or uh, the Knights of Columbus. And those are all good things. But to try and get, you know, a thousand people to say precisely the same thing about what a parish is about is probably a difficult thing anywhere across the country. Mm. Hmm. And so are these some of the background thoughts that uh, kind of led to your reflections and uh, the conferences that you were giving to our young priests? Yes, it, you know, it, it was. I, you know, the experience of just how different sometimes um, where our people are at. They're, they're very good people, that, but they've had a specific experience of parish life for the last 50 years. And, you know, when we begin to see, and I think, I'm assuming it's the same out here. I don't want to assume if I'm incorrect. You know, let me know. But you know, definitely before the pandemic, people saw a decline in the attendance at church. And after the pandemic, we have not fully rebounded. We definitely have seen you know, our numbers go up, but I don't think we are, we are at pre-pandemic levels. No, I, I think uh, some have said maybe 70%, 75%. And it varies because some of our parishes are fully back uh-huh. and others are, see a lower participation rate. So right. it, it, there's some diversity even on that front. Yeah, and but I mean, that that example, you know, just where did our people go? You know, what what was what was nourishing for them or what did they, I don't know, what, what, what were they looking for? I guess that's just the question. And what did their faith mean to them, you know, especially the, the Sunday Eucharist? Um, and, and so that it just kind of, you know, it, it made me really think about what type of a culture, society that we're living in. And I think oftentimes as Catholics, we simply don't, we're not aware of the cultural influences on our mindset. Um, and one of those things that, that I've, you know, just realized is, how privatized faith is in the sense that if it works for you, great. But, you know, whether or not it has any consequences to the larger community is a separate question. And so uh, I think many of our people find that their faith means something to them and the way that they practice it. But I don't know if they necessarily see the broader uh, consequences of practicing the faith or looking at the world from a faith perspective. And uh, yeah, I think that's a challenge, at least for us in the Archdiocese of Chicago. Um, and, and obviously you refer, you know, we're at a different scale here in the Diocese of Des Moines, although 70% of our people uh, identify as Catholic are in the Des Moines metro region, but the, the great rural uh, you know, resource and, and gift that that is. But uh, young professionals, you know, Parish? What's that? You know that they don't even have an experience a parish to refer to in this way, and so you know that identity that's there, and so uh, you you kind of your title of your talk, priesthood in a secular society, uh, that can kind of suggest a kind of you know Augustine city of God, city of man, and uh, you know without trying to set up antagonism here or kind of you know us against the world, uh, what we're about. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, a part of it, it was uh, I came across a book by Cardinal de Kessel. He's a cardinal in, in Belgium. I really know nothing about him. I've done a little more research since I read the book, but it was just the title of the book that caught my eye, uh, Faith and Religion in a Secular Society. And 
I think for most of us, we, it's like, well, what happened in these last 50 years? You know, but, but really this whole process of where we're at now started 400, 500 years ago. And it's just been unfolding. And, you know, I think it's the Europe, Europeans experience it before the Americans. And then the Americans experience it more in the city areas and then the rural areas. And now you see that same kind of mentality creeping into the South American countries, you know, as well. And so, uh, you know, as that mentality um, kind of infects or touches all of us, what does it mean? How do we react? Wow. And you've kind of set the context for us. And so we look to see where, what uh, maybe some of the threads that you drew out for some of our younger priests. Stay with us as we continue our conversation with Monsignor Dennis Lyle about the priesthood in a secular society. You're listening to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and the Spirit Catholic Radio Network. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio is provided by the Sarah Vocations Ministry, including the St. Sarah Club of Des Moines and the Sarah Club of Council Bluffs. Sarah is an apostolate of the Worldwide Catholic Church dedicated to fostering and supporting priesthood and religious vocations. Sarans strive to accomplish their mission through prayer, fellowship, and service to the bishop, priests, sisters, and all in religious formation, and in doing so to increase their own holiness. Learn more at joinsarah.org, join S-E-R-R-A.org. Thank you, Sarans, for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Dad, how are things going in St. Vincent de Paul? Awesome, Zoe. Our 6th Avenue Army Post Road and Windsor Heights locations are really busy. Steve Havman, Executive Director of St. Vincent de Paul, thanking you for your continued support. How can people help St. Vincent de Paul, Dad? By donating and shopping. St. Vincent de Paul helps everyone, even kids' lives. <laughs> yes, Zoe, even kids' lives. Thanks for shopping at our St. Vincent de Paul thrift stores. St. Welcome back to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. Okay. Well, Monsignor, you made reference to the, the centuries of context that has led us to today, but maybe let's fast forward a little bit since our this final segment that we're here. Uh, curiously, I see the title of your conferences, uh, some strange bedfellows, if you will, St. Therese of Lisieux, whose uh, feast day is coming up here, the little flower, and Nietzsche, of all people. So how, what's the connection there? Well, it's just a coincidence or providential that I read the book by Cardinal de Kessel about secular society and a play by a Carmelite nun uh, down in South Africa. And the play is uh, Nietzsche is My Brother. And it's a fictitious play about St. Therese and the philosopher Nietzsche kind of dialoguing with one another. They never met, but they did. They were contemporaries. Mm. Um, and so, and that experience or that play kind of draws out that even though there's so many differences between the religious and the secular world, uh, what the play shows is that there is a similarity there. And the, uh, the author of the play draws on Therese's own dark moments at the end of her life. And, uh, you know, her real questioning and, you know, what is there after this? She, she really was, uh, at a, a wall rising to the stars. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, and so, you know, she uses that, the author uses that as a connection for you know, Nietzsche, who represents, you know, the secular modern world of really not knowing what is there. What do we know? What can we know? And the idea that we can find a common experience, you know, that the sense of darkness also overcomes those of us are men and women of faith. Um, you know, it's not all uh, bright and sunny. That's one of the lines that Therese mentions in the play. Her sisters are reminding her of how wonderful it was growing up. And she says, well, it wasn't always that way. <laughs> Remember, mom died. That was difficult for me, she says. Mm -hmm. You know, so... Yeah. So I suspect you're not exhorting the younger priests to be culture warriors and all this, but given that we call things by their name and what we find in you know, either the agnosticism or the antagonism. What was your counsel to them? What was the encouragement that you offered? Well, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm following, you know, Pope Francis. Pardon me, I, I feel badly because I don't always have a real clear answer uh, for that question. And it's, you know, I find what I'm most comfortable with is simply being able to accompany people in that journey. And I, I often think of a, a story told by me, a, a woman that, 
joined us at the, on the faculty at the seminary. And she had been working in a Planned Parenthood uh, office for a number of years. And at some point, a priest challenged her on that. And her reaction was very, you know, what's he talking about? But that comment planted a seed. And she said eventually she came around to realize that that was not the best place for her. But she was very grateful that the priest did not give up on her or his friendship with her over those years as she was kind of working it out in her mind. So I've often found that as a a good model. Um, It's something we have to be patient with. God's time is very different from our time. But I think simply being able to accompany and be with people as they go through that process is important. And to the the solidarity that they experience with each other to kind of remind ourselves that we don't allow ourselves to become too cynical. Uh, and, you know, they kind of call each other out once in a while, too, that, uh, you know, that we're to be beacons of hope here and not uh, you know, pointing out what's not all the time, you know, even as we're to have a prophetic voice. Monsignor Dennis Lyle, uh, thank you. Uh, this was not your vacation coming to Iowa. We're welcome to take you to a iCubs game, or we'll go back. You've been to the Field of Dreams, I've I know. Been to the Field, Field of Dreams, Dreams so, yeah. yeah. So and any opportunity to get out of Chicago traffic is very much appreciated. So. <laughs> right. I don't think he the, wants to go corn, to an yeah. Iowa Cubs game. So thank you for building up the Church of the Four Dioceses of Iowa. No, my Blessings pleasure to be here. Thank you again for the invitation. Well, this is another edition of Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. Thank you to Monsignor Lyle and to all of our listeners in Iowa, Nebraska, Wisconsin, or wherever you may be listening to Iowa Catholic Radio and the Spirit Catholic Radio Network. You can hear Making It Personal with Bishop William Johnson every week on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Making It Personal is provided by Sarah Vocations Ministry. Learn more at joinserra.org.